Hello, everyone. Um, I hope everyone uh, is in and you can hear me well. Uh, welcome to this virtual roundtable on the challenges and opportunities in strengthening distribution and supply chain logistics to accelerate uptake of vaccines in Africa and where research can help. My name is Montasser Kamal and I'm the director of the Global Health Program at Canada's International Development Research Centre in Ottawa, Canada. For the past 50 years, IDRC has been investing in knowledge, innovations, and solutions to some of the most pressing development challenges in low- and middle-income countries. Essentially, we fund research and innovations that are led by researchers and research institutions in the Global South. Um, um, our goal is to support research people in the Global South to find uh, support people in the Global South to find innovative solutions to their own development challenges. As you may already know, uh, many of you already know, only 1% of vaccines used in Africa are manufactured on the continent. To address this issue, the Africa CDC has set an ambitious goal of developing, producing, and distributing at least 60% of Africa's vaccines by 2040. This would improve Africa's, Africa's long-term supply resilience and result in improved global health security. In support of this important goal, IDRC is convening a series of roundtables that will bring together experts from a variety of disciplines to share their insights and identify solutions to support and accelerate the achievement of Africa's vaccine scale-up goals. Today's roundtable is the second in this series and is, uh, is uh, co-organized by IDRC in collaboration with Global Affairs Canada. In the first roundtable, uh, we had a distinguished panel of guest speakers. Some of the key points that I would like to share with you today uh, that came out from that first roundtable and to set the stage for this uh, second roundtable, I'll share them with you here. Uh, those points that were made uh, during that round, first roundtable include the first one is vaccine manufacturing should be seen as part of a wider uh, of wider efforts to enhancing global health security. That is the need to make the world a safer place by investing in science, research, and innovation. Second point uh, from the first round table was Africa's lack of unified and robust regulatory framework for vaccine production. Uh, uh, is, uh, was remarked. Uh, hence, the imperative for a coordinated approach to harmonize vaccine policies, production standards, and access, providing leadership in the process. Hence, initiatives such as Partnership for v African Vaccines Manufacturing and the Africa Medicine Agency are critical in building a resilient and coordinated vaccine manufacturing ecosystem. A third point from the first round table that there was that there is a critical need for technology transfer, particularly in leveraging existing globally recognized priority products to expedite progress across the continent. The next point, human capital development and nurturing a young biotech industry represents significant opportunities for the continent. And finally, global financing partners play a crucial role in maintaining long-term readiness for future vaccine production. The recording of the first webinar is available online and we encourage you to tune into it. If you have missed it, um, it is available on IDRC website uh, online. Uh, for now, we'll turn uh, our attention now to this set, uh, rec uh, second round table. And to kick, today's, to kick off the, today's this, uh, session, we will have a keynote address followed by a panel discussion. And after the panel discussion, uh, discussion we will have a, a, a Q&A segment where we invite you, uh, our participants and audiences, to uh, ask questions and provide comments via the chat function of the QDO platform. I will, a warm welcome to our speakers and to all of you joining us from across the world today. Now, before I introduce and invite our keynote speaker, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from IDRC's head office, which is situated on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people, whose stewardship on the land and waters can uh, we now call Ottawa date back time immemorial. 
Indigenous knowledge is strongly linked to the land and ways of life. As an organization supporting and sharing knowledge in Canada and internationally, this acknowledgement means reaffirming the, uh, val the value of local and Indigenous knowledge. Our acknowledgement also aims to recognize the history and experience of colonization. Much work remains to be done on the path to reconciliation, including through decolonizing knowledge. This is a reflection of our commitment to continue to support and honor indigenous and local voices. You are, cer you are certainly joining us today from many places near and far, and I would, I would uh, I also want to acknowledge the ancestral stewards of those territories. Thank you, Miigwech. Also, before I move uh, further, I want to alert you that you can, uh, there is translate interpretation for this whole uh, round table webinar, and you can access it on the bottom left of your uh, screen. Uh, now, allow me to welcome our uh, and introduce our keynote uh, speaker today. Um, Dr. Ahmed Ogwell is the country acting uh, uh, is sorry is the acting deputy director general of Africa CDC. He is also the founding deputy director, and in these roles, he has led the strategic work and oversight of Africa CDC. He works closely with African Union member states and partners to deliver on the mandate of Africa CDC of preventing and controlling diseases in Africa. Dr. Ogwell, uh, we welcome you to provide your keynote uh, address. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Antisar. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen. Okay, not working too well from my end. If uh, they can, sh if you can share from that side, that will be useful. It's not loading on my end. Thank you. We'll uh, we'll do that right now. Thank you. Yes, and um, as we wait for that to happen, um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it is that you're joining us from. Um, <clears throat> and um, I would like to share uh, just a few thoughts to provoke our discussions around what we are doing here. Uh, at Africa CDC in shaping uh, Africa's vaccine supply um, and landscape. And to begin with, <clears throat> um, I would like to recall um, that, next slide please. Yeah, I would like to recall that um, uh, during <clears throat> the pandemic, we went through a lot of experiences as a continent, as an institution, and those experiences have translated into a concrete action that um, uh, our heads of state, our ministers um, have um, uh, made decisions upon that we need uh, to take forward as Africa CDC. One very key uh, thing that we learned is we need to do things differently. And not just as Africa, uh, but also as the world in the health security architecture space. And uh, that is why in 2021, we did make um, a, a call for a new public health order. And in that um, new public health order, um, we have five pillars. And the third pillar is what I would like to speak to today. The third pillar speaks about expanding local manufacturing of health products, all of them, vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics, and other non-pharmaceutical uh, products that we use, uh, not just in healthcare, but particularly in, during health emergencies. And <clears throat> when we look at, um, next slide, when we look at um, uh, the initiative that came out of um, <clears throat> our um, attempt at early implementation of the new public health order, we launched in April of 2021, um, the Partnership for African Vaccines Manufacturing. We call it PAVM. And this was in direct response to the third pillar of the new public health order for local manufacture. And our role as a partnership, um, um, there, are three, there are four big areas. One is on markets for locally produced health products. And we would like that the, market, the, the African market 1.4 going on to 1.5 billion people really is supportive of this uh, vision that we have of manufacturing locally. So ensuring that market is secured is a very big part of our work. Second, 
is strengthening local R&D ecosystem because we know that for um, uh, local manufacturing to be effective, we must have effective R&D as well um, so that we own um, the intellectual property on the, on the uh, products that are being developed so that we own uh, the process of uh, identifying the priority uh, disease areas and therefore the priority health products uh, so that we own um, the whole chain from inception to the market. Thirdly, is the need for capacity building. There's a very huge gap in as far as talent development is concerned. And um, uh, the PABM, this partnership is uh, designed to be able to address uh, these capacity gaps that we have uh, in as far as local manufacturing is concerned. And fourth uh, role is to incubate and then scale to capacity um, all aspects of local manufacturing, whether it is infrastructure, it is uh, human capital, it is resources, it is market shaping, it is actual uh, um, you know, product um, reaching the market, all aspects need to be incubated and then scaled up um, as appropriate. So PAVM, next slide, PAVM has um, uh, eight bold programs that were defined back in 2021. And these products are linked in a way that ensures we can be able to begin where it is easiest, depending on the product that you're talking about, um, and then go around the whole circle uh, so that um, we have um, the new public health orders third pillar being uh, successfully implemented. But um, in as far as um, our agenda setting is concerned, as Africa CDC, we've been charged with the responsibility of coordination. We will coordinate all aspects of um, the eight bold programs, whether it is R&D and towel development, whether it is infrastructure development, uh, tech transfer and uh, intellectual property, regulatory strengthening, access to financing, and eventually market design and demand intelligence. All these come as a package, and we, uh, as Africa CDC, have been uh, tasked with the, with the responsibility of coordinating what is going on on the continent and uh, setting the agenda on different platforms uh, so that this um, vision that we have under the PAVM uh, is actually uh, realized. Next slide. And when the decision was being made about um, uh, setting up the partnership, a very broad um, consultation ensued within the continent. And this particular goal of 60% uh, of vaccines uh, that are being administered on the continent uh, to be locally produced by 2040. We are at 1% today, and we need to get to 60% uh, by 2040. And uh, we think that uh, if we have good pace, particularly during this year, um, um, we then aim for about 30% by 2030. And then a decade later, we hit the 60%. Uh, percent. Um, and these are, not, uh, th th these are not small numbers in as far as the doses of vaccines are concerned. They're big numbers. And if we are to, if we are to reach 30%, it means that uh, 550 million doses um, need to be supplied, uh, need to be manufactured and supplied here on the continent. And um, by 2040, it means 1.3 billion doses need to do the same. So the capacity that is required to be able to provide um, uh, these millions of doses um, need to be built. We are not starting from scratch, but they need to be built in the coming um, uh, years. Next slide. So we do have some challenges on the continent. And um, we are um, um, trying to limit ourselves to the key ones. On the supply side, um, economies of scale are not very good uh, due to the fragmented uh, demand. And we're trying to work on that uh, through pool procurement. There's low offtake um, uh, in as far as um, uh, uh, the journey towards local manufacturing uh, is concerned. And this, we are also uh, um, doing some consultation within the continent to try and address and concentrated markets uh, to compete in, uh, which then challenges the investment case for any uh, molecule that we would like to, to manufacture. On the demand side, we have a lot of fragmentation and therefore you cannot be able to negotiate at scale. Um, and this reduces uh, the power of the 1.5 billion uh, uh, market. Uh, secondly, um, uh, the increasing number of Gavi transitioning countries um, uh, is making it uh, difficult for some of them uh, to plan uh, ahead 
because they don't know how they're going to cover uh, some of those vaccines that Gavi is currently covering. But these, these challenges on both the supply and the demand side, we are looking at them as um, you know, opportunities. And uh, uh, part of the reason why uh, today we have a lot of communication and uh, discussion on the continent uh, to address some of these challenges. Next slide. So our approach to these challenges include these three, that we are supporting the supply side by improving access to tech transfer. And then we are working with financial institutions, particularly African ones, the Flexing Bank and uh, African Development Bank, to try and get the required resources uh, to support the supply side. The second is we are supporting the demand side through consolidating the markets. And we consolidate markets by ensuring that we have pooled procurement mechanism, which was discussed at length during the uh, last week's uh, assembly of heads of states here at the Africa Union. And third is we are engaging with all the relevant actors who are within the vaccine supply ecosystem, um, Gavi, UNICEF, WHO, ETC, so that we can be able to get uh, the sourcing being done here on the continent. And Gavi's announcement of the Africa Vaccines Manufacturing Alliance Accelerator is a very good way of uh, uh, jumpstarting some of this work uh, here on the continent. Then finally, last slide, <clears throat> is um, what then we uh, want to focus on um, uh, here on the continent. We want to develop um, uh, a pool procurement mechanism that will ensure that the journey towards uh, um, a stable market uh, actually begins. So we want to, do, to consolidate the demand, we want to be able to focus and work with the manufacturers that way they are comfortable that the market is there. We want to centralize some processes and platforms so that uh, we don't have too many fragmented activities that are going on uh, in different countries. And we want to enable uh, the ecosystem to function irrespective of which stage a country may be. And pool procurement mechanism we have found is going to be a very important uh, enabler for the work that we want to do of getting manufacturing to reach 60% on the continent uh, by 2030. It is ambitious, it is possible, and we are confident that um, with the support from the right stakeholders, Africa should be able to do this um, uh, as per target, 60% by 2040. I thank you very much, um, and back to you, uh, Monsa. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Ahmed. You uh, raised the really uh, very uh, many uh, very important points uh, in your very short uh, introduction, and we hope we're going to, we are looking forward to hearing more details from you. Um, you spoke about sort of, uh, uh, you know, the important focus on market dynamics, production, procurement, um, capacity gaps, and and uh, um, uh, and supply chain um, challenges. Um, and I think uh, also you really uh, raised a very important point about the importance of agenda setting and coordination on the continent, and to have a balance between a centralized approach, but also uh, an opportunity, um, an approach that allows uh, uh, all markets and all people to have access to uh, to the vaccines. Um, you know, the the kind of the interim uh, uh, plan or target of 30% by 2030, as you mentioned, is very, very ambitious. And 2030 in the big scheme of things is around the corner. So we're really looking forward to uh, hearing your, uh, again, in the next segments of the of our conversation and webinar to hear more from you on, on um, the challenges and opportunities you are seeing in the in the next period. Um, so we have now we are now we thank you very much again, uh, Ahmed, we now uh, uh, transition into the next segment of this webinar, which is to hear from um, other um, uh, other experts and, and professionals in working in this area who represent different sectors and key actors uh, uh, from the global south, uh, who we have assembled here uh, on the on the for this um, conversation. Uh, we have um, first. I would like to introduce Michelle Seidel, who is the senior immunization advisor and global lead immunization supply chain at UNICEF. Uh, in her current role, she works in collaboration with global partners and agencies to support governments to strengthen health systems, to improve immunization government, uh, coverage and equity. Um, and uh, second, our second panelist is Charles Shea uh, Wisonghi, who is the regional advisor and team lead for vaccine preventable diseases at uh, with, uh, WHO's uh, regional office for Africa. 
is an he's also an extraordinary professor of global health at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, um, and he's a physician with postgraduate training in epidemiology, evidence-based uh, healthcare, and vaccinology. We also have uh, Jacqueline Chiari, who is the regional program manager for uh, global health uh, security at AMREF Health Africa, where she provides managerial oversight, strategic leadership, and technical expertise in the dynamic health security uh, unit uh, that runs health programs across sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we have, I'm sure, as you can un understand, uh, we have so many questions, but we'll try to limit it to uh, kind of two rounds of questions for now to allow for time for the Q&A for you, our participants, to join us uh, today in this conversation. Um, I'll, uh, I'll direct my first question to Michelle. Um, uh, so Michelle, UNICEF works with governments, partners, and suppliers to procure and deliver medical supplies that meet the needs of children and young people around the world. Some, uh, during uh, uh, emergency times and during uh, normal times. So could you describe UNICEF's range of supply chain models for vaccines and, uh, and your approaches to strengthening national supply chain systems in Africa? And you have uh, three minutes, uh, please, for, uh, for your intervention. Please go ahead, Michelle. Great, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, uh, in terms of our support to countries and how we approach things, I think benchmarking the supply chain is one of the first things that any country starts with and building that capacity within governments to be able to do that as well. Assessing where the gaps are and developing those improvement plans to be able to have a functional supply chain where we're getting um, vaccines right from the port of entry down to the health facility service delivery levels um, in order to ensure that the program runs effectively. Second to that is the, our, coordinate, uh, our support on coordination mechanisms. So um, national logistics working groups are often the central body for a lot of the supply chain work. So making sure that they have, they actively using data um, at an operational as well as a strategic level and building out that capacity as well. Here we also lean on regional institutions uh, such as the Rwanda Center of Excellence, Logivac and other regional regional bodies that um, to be able to provide that support to countries. Um, so really having local solutions to, to strengthen that. Data visibility is obviously critical. You cannot uh, manage what you cannot measure, right? So um, our strengthening in terms of uh, logistics management information systems, the use of that data for, for governments to be able to manage the supply chain effectively. Um, and very closely linked to that, of course, is the forecasting um, and, and the supply planning. So making sure that uh, from procurement, those vaccines get into countries and, um, and, and get down to where they are needed. Um, obviously, we do a lot of procurement of cold chain equipment as well. Vaccines being temperature sensitive commodities um, need to be stored um, at, at appropriate temperatures. Um, and here we work a lot in, in uh, ensuring that they are optimal and driving that um, technology development in a lot of instances, but also ensuring that there's uh, um, optimal technologies and that the, the that cold chain is stored in the right places to optimize the supply chain design of a country, but also to ensure that we that that at the lower levels that we're getting the right um, storage capacities in place to provide that uh, capacity and 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 the coverage that's that's required there. Um, we do a lot of um, support in terms of uh, temperature monitoring studies, also to assess where the weaknesses in the supply chain are, and make sure that we are um, designing solutions for that. Then, of course, we've got a very big work stream on solarization of health facilities. Obviously, this is to improve access to, to, to services and comprehensive services. So looking at it from a people-centric point of view, a patient-centered point of view, 
you. Um, but then also um, and making sure that we are looking at our carbon footprint or, or countries' carbon footprints and, and uh, reducing uh, that within countries. Then, of course, distribution is key. We've seen from our own uh, EVM assessments over the last 20 years that distribution is one of the you know, the weak links so getting that those vaccines from from uh, to where they're needed from the point of entry is is a critical area that 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 requires a lot of strengthening so supporting governments in terms of strengthening their own systems um uh, developing those skills in terms of contract management for vendors where applicable um is is something that we we we're, we're very um very much engaged in and then of course um you know uh, out of all of this, we want to make sure that we are strengthening local economies when we do engage, uh, when when we are looking at that. We may, uh, first and foremost, it's to improve government's uh, systems and capacities um, instead of setting up those parallel mechanisms um, and, and obviously reducing our carbon footprint as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Michelle. You've uh, summed up a whole uh, a bunch of issues in a very, very tight uh, time. So really, really appreciate it. Uh, I particularly appreciate the points you raised about data and research uh, that you know and, and forecasting, which all require uh, robust data systems, information systems, and not only in, as you mentioned on the operational side, but also for strategic uh, decision making. Uh, and many of us know and have seen the images of uh, cold chain supplied by UNICEF to many countries in the past. And really uh, good to hear what you're describing as kind of the transitioning of that to kind of local economies, local capacities, local um, uh, systems, and also um, your um, attention now to and supporting the countries and 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 uh, about the um, the carbon footprint of all of these uh, efforts which are, of course are important uh, but now we need to add uh, definitely the uh, the solarization carbon footprint and uh, um, and climate change concerns uh, into into the mix of all of this so thanks very much michelle we'll come back to you uh, i'm sure with some uh, with some uh, further points for the discussion. Uh, but now I'd like to move to uh, Charles. Um, uh, Charles, you know, the Vaccine Preventable Disease Program at WHO Regional Office for Africa supports the achievement of universal immunization coverage in the Africa African region, which has been a dream for, uh, for many people uh, in global health. Um, as part of a broader effort to strengthen primary health care and achieve universal health coverage. So could you please uh, share with us what are WHO uh, AFRO's strategies for addressing supply and demand side barriers to vaccine uptake? Um, in a short uh, three minutes, and we uh, give you the floor uh, now, uh, Charles, please. Uh, Charles, can you hear us? We can't hear you. If you're online, I thought I saw you a moment ago. Okay, I think maybe you are experiencing some technical difficulties. So maybe, Jacqueline, I'm going to move to you and maybe come back to Charles when he's back online. Um, Jacqueline, you can hear me, right? I can see you, so that's great. Yeah. Um, so, you know, AMREF has been uh, very much involved in scaling uh, last mile delivery efforts of vaccine, especially to marginalized communities. Um, so could you give examples of community-led solutions for addressing vaccine hesitancy and misinformation that AMREF or your partners have uh, implemented in the recent past? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And also thank you to the other speakers uh, that have talked a little bit about what happens upstream in ensuring that we have the vaccines in place and where we come in as AMREF as well as other partners that we are working with on the ground is really ensuring that these vaccines get uh, to the arms that they need to get uh, on. I think if we all remember during the Ebola response, one of the things that has constantly affected our response to Ebola or even the vaccination efforts for Ebola is the level of misinformation that we have at the community level. We have seen community members steal their clients 
uh, from the hospitals, from the health facilities, because they don't quite understand what is happening. And therefore, what we have done, especially uh, in health emergencies, is really leverage the existing trust. Uh, we must appreciate that communities are organized in certain ways. They, are, they just don't exist uh, separately. They are organized. We have civil society organizations at the community level. We have community, community networks, and therefore we have the community gatekeepers. And therefore what we do during health emergencies is try and identify which community health organizations exist at, at that level, who are the community gatekeepers, and leverage the trust that the community members have with these organizations and individuals to uh, identify the misinformation, co-create the messages, and really use the same channels in reaching out to the community members. So leveraging the existing trust is something that um, we have worked on, worked with very well in the different countries that we've worked uh, with. Uh, together working with the civil society organizations, for example, we were able to deploy over 31 million COVID vaccines uh, during the response, which was quite um, a task. Uh, given the urgency with which we needed to deploy that. So we saw countries like Djibouti, for example, when we worked with the imams, uh, we had advised that the best way to deploy these vaccines was through moonlighting. So we adapted our vaccination strategies to ensure that we could deploy these, engage the community members at night when they attend the mosques uh, to ensure that they can access the, the vaccine. So of course, leveraging the, uh, the trust that is already existing was one of the key strategies that we had to, uh, to employ during in, to ensure that the vaccines get to the to the arms. The second thing was around segmenting the population. I think uh, if we remember most of the messaging at the onset of the response efforts was generalized uh, information, uh, which left out some very unique cohorts of the population. We're talking about people who live with disabilities, for example, the blind, the deaf. And we had uh, networks of people living with disabilities reach out to us to just make sure that we can work with them in developing co-creating messages that speak to these audiences in zambia for example which is in the southern hub of africa we had to develop braille messaging uh, for the blind uh, people the people living with blindness in this region and this was adopted by the ministry of health and with that we also worked with their leadership in the uh, in the pwd uh, networks to ensure that we reach these people uh, so again augmenting the different segments of the society and making sure that the messages are directly targeting these people was uh, another strategy that worked and was very effective in ensuring that there was equity in access and really dealing with the missing information that we had at the community level. Again, another unique um, cohort in the population was the youth. Uh, over 65% of the population that we have here on the continent is young. Uh, the youth, and it's not an, a homogeneous cohort of the population, they are different. The kind of messaging that goes on uh, amongst the youth in the urban centers is very different from what you find in the rural areas, in the peri-urban uh, areas, and therefore working with them was very critical. We conducted uh, research here in uh, AMREF uh, that target most, targeted most of the sub-Saharan region to try and identify the kind of misinformation that was going on amongst this cohort of the population and worked with them in crafting messages and crafting these kind of, uh, youth-led campaigns to ensure that we were able to reach that cohort of the population, especially because some of them are also being stigmatized as the super spreaders, the carriers uh, and the super spreaders of this. So we also worked with them in trying to build confidence in the vaccine in the households that uh, they were living in. We saw Africa CDC also take on similar approaches with their Bingwa initiative, uh, where they worked with the youth to run the youth campaigns and also ensure that the vaccination, the misinformation was addressed, as well as making sure that the relatives who are living with the youth were able to access the vaccination. So a lot of peer-to-peer -peer advocacy, especially in working with the youth, who happen to be the largest uh, population or cohort of the population here in the African region. Last but not least is really uh, using the community-centered digital solutions, mm -hmm. existing ones, because I think we all appreciate that uh, during health emergencies might not be the most appropriate time to develop new solutions. So looking at what was already there and using these solutions to track the rumors that were there at the community level, these solutions were running on open source uh, software, which means that uh, it could be easily used, adapted for use in rumor tracking. Uh, we had the data managers looking at the data at the, at the back end to just ensure that uh, we can segregate, we can use that data to co-create messages with the community members that were reporting the rumors that are being captured 
from the community level. So leveraging digital solutions during that time, existing digital solutions, working with the community members to co-create those messages also really accelerated our efforts in addressing the, the misinformation, building evidence, and just making sure that there's continued trust on the vaccination programs. Thank you. Jacqueline, thanks so much. I think we can spend the whole uh, webinar just unpacking all of these uh, items that you mentioned about, or all these uh, points you mentioned about sort of the community community aspect or from the uh, community side on the vaccine uptake, the vaccine rollout, the distribution, the importance of the segmentations of the market or populations that you mentioned, uh, which also um, uh, links to uh, points uh, mentioned earlier um, uh, for, by Michelle and Ahmed. Um, and these are really all important points. You also talked about the digital solutions and hopefully we'll come in the Q&A segment about the uh, what the artificial intelligence will do to all the, you know, to, to improve the uh, potential or improve the potential responsibly, um, uh, improve the uptake of vaccines and the and understanding of the uh, vaccine markets and uptake. Um, also, you mentioned the point about research, which is very important, uh, you know, kind of operational research, implementation research, which is also really key for uh, for the uptake, especially for uh, 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 reaching uh, populations that are in, uh, living in situations of vulnerability or are in situations of vulnerability. Great points. Thanks so much, uh, Jacqueline. Uh, Charles, um, you're back online. I see you. So I hopefully uh, you can hear me well now. Um, can you? Oh, okay. Charles cannot hear us. Uh, so while we work on that, um, I will go to uh, Ahmed for this, uh, just to wrap up this uh, first round of, uh, uh, of questions or uh, 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 panel of the panel. Uh, if you have any reflection, any further reflections, uh, Ahmed, on the points that were raised by uh, Michelle or Jacqueline, uh, please come in and uh, uh, we can discuss it and then we'll move on to the next segment and hopefully we'll, Charles will be able to join us then. Ahmed, can you hear us? Okay, I think the technology is not cooperating today, but let us keep uh, moving forward. Uh, I'm going to go now to our second round uh, for a conversation with the panel. Um, and I want to switch gear a little bit to talk uh, more specifically about uh, research gaps and, and opportunities. Uh, Charles, can you hear us? Charles, can you hear us? Okay, I think there's still a challenge with the technology. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to switch gear to uh, start uh, learning a little bit more about research priorities and knowledge gaps. Both, uh, all of these, uh, those points were uh, raised or this topic was raised by uh, Ahmed, Michelle and Jacqueline. So I really would like to dig in a little bit deeper into that in this uh, second round of questions. And maybe um, I'll start with you again, Jacqueline, if you don't mind. Um, uh, to tell us from AMREF's perspective. So what knowledge gaps do you see in terms of addressing vaccine hesitancy and misinformation in Africa? Uh, you must have had a few lessons from the COVID vaccine for you know 31 million vaccines distributed. You must have had a few lessons there. So please uh, yeah. share that with us. Thank you. Of course, a lot of lessons. And I think uh, the best part is that we have opportunity to apply these lessons. Uh, we all appreciate that Africa is reporting over 150 health emergencies, disease outbreaks on an annual basis. We have a lot of uh, R&D going on in trying to develop vaccines for some of these uh, dis emerging diseases or reimagined diseases on the continent. I think uh, right now there's effort to deploy the cholera vaccine, for example, in Zambia, Malawi, and Kenya, which are countries uh, that are already battling cholera for the last uh, three or so months. Uh, we already have the Ebola vaccine, but the uptake is still limited. Uh, we also have recent efforts towards ensuring that uh, as much as possible, we can have our teenage girls access the HPV vaccine. So there's a change of um, target um, 
audience, for the lack of a better word, in as far as the vaccination programs is concerned. Typically in Africa, or at least in Kenya, most of the vaccination programs go until the age of one year. But now we are seeing more and more ask to uh, deploy adult vaccination. So it would be good to know um, how the COVID-19 vaccination efforts are impacting um, our acceptance of other adult vaccination programs, especially because this is something we are likely to see more and more as we have more vaccine discoveries, more drug discoveries in trying to address the emerging diseases on the continent. So how did the COVID-19 vaccine impact uh, our acceptance of adult vaccination programs? Because this is likely to be uh, part of the routine immunization moving forward in the region. So it would be good to look at that. Um, it has somehow been uh, forgotten given that the COVID risk is now uh, controlled, but I think we shouldn't drop the ball on that because there's still um, there's still uh, the intention to really ensure that we can deploy the adult vaccination programs. The second one would be around the residual misinformation due to the COVID-19 vaccination. I think uh, we now have the privilege of um, of knowing better, understanding better how the COVID-19 vaccination impacted us. Unfortunately, we also have a lot of misinformation going around around that, especially when you look at what we have on social media right now. There's a lot of you know, uh, unconfirmed reports of younger people being uh, affected by cardiovascular diseases, for example, heart attacks and all amongst athletics uh, and things like that. We also seen a lot of reports of long COVID um, on the social media. We do not know whether this is true or not. And this misinformation is likely to affect our efforts to deploy, continue deploying the COVID-19 vaccine, vaccine itself. Uh, to the vulnerable populations. I think the recommendation is still that we need to continue deploying this to the vulnerable population. So it's good to check, especially amongst the populations here, how all this misinformation is going to affect our ability to continue deploying the C19, the COVID-19 vaccination for the targeted vulnerable population, the healthcare workers, the elderly, the people living with non-communicable diseases. Because if we don't understand that, then it means that uh, our efforts in as far as deploying the COVID-19 vaccine are going to be halted, not because the vaccine is not good, but because we have a lot of misunderstanding in that space. So a bit more research on how all this misinformation is going to affect our ability to continue deploying the COVID-19 vaccine uh, for the uh, targeted uh, populations. Last but not least, I think we need to also look outside the health sector and look at other social determinants uh, of vaccine uptake. Um, and I say this because when we look at the trends, especially in uh, most of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa, the regions that had really good uptake are also the regions that had very strong health systems. Uh, in Kenya, for example, when you look at Northeastern, the places that report very low routine immunization coverage are also the areas that reported very low COVID-19 vaccination um, uptake uh, generally and therefore sometimes we will assume that the reason why the populations or the targeted audiences are not taking up the vaccine is because they do not trust it but sometimes it's because there are access issues around that so it would be good to also look outside the health sector and just try and understand how these other social determinants of health uh, are affecting um, our trust in the health system our trust with the health authorities and our ability to really uh, take on the adult vaccination programs. I think those three uh, would really inform our adult vaccination programs in, in future. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Vaclina. Sir, you have the important point about sort of the age uh, segmentation and the age, different age uh, uh, groups in the population. And you mentioned earlier in your previous intervention about youth as well. So, you know, children, youth and, and adults, these are all uh, there are determinants of, of access and acceptance and and how misinformation is treated by each. So I think this is really um, very, very helpful. Uh, also, uh, the, the really important points you mentioned about health, the link between health systems and the uptake of, uh, of vaccines is very important. And as many, uh, many uh, observers and, and uh, actor practitioners in global health for a long time have complained about the sort of the um, verticalization or the siloization of investment, you know, if it's in vaccine or it's in one service or another, um, the importance of really the whole uh, strengthening whole systems to um, to, uh, to 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 
improve access and coverage of, of all essential services. So um, I think, thanks very much, uh, Jacqueline, again, really important points. Uh, I'm going to go now to Ahmed with my next question. Ahmed, can you hear me? Uh, can you see, uh, hear us and see us? Yes, <clears throat> I okay, can hear great. you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to have my next question to you, uh, again, uh, along the same lines of kind of research needs and, and knowledge gaps to ask you from um, Africa CDC perspective, uh, what are the what are some of the research needs uh, that you have seen or that you see uh, in terms of uh, vaccine delivery and or uptake? Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks very much. So the 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 two, I would say, the, th the two that I will prioritize in as far as research needs and uh, how to use the, the results is concerned for vaccines uptake. The first is health workers. Um, we did some, um, uh, during COVID, we did some uh, rapid um, uh, operational research in uh, a number of countries, I think about 14, 15 countries, and there was still this significant uh, proportion of health workers who had hesitation to take vaccines. Now, if as a health worker, you are hesitating, we want to understand very carefully. And that is one of the things that we want to do uh, this year to understand a very in detailed manner, why are health workers having hesitation? So that we can be able to address uh, uh, that, uh, that, that, um, uh, those concerns and uh, see if they are linked to the community hesitation that they may be there in as far as um, uh, vaccines uptake is concerned. So this is something that is a priority for us. Uh, second area of research that uh, we really would like uh, more information on is um, uh, when you look at um, the profiles of um, the different um, uh, parts of the, of, the, of, of the community, whether it is young people, it is old people, it is the gender's uh, uh, approach to um, uh, vaccine uptake, it's quite different when you uh, group them. And we would like to do in the community now some research to see um, when you take men, when you take women, when you take young people, um, uh, when you take the senior um, uh, citizens, what are those concerns that they have? And um, um, that way we can start working on mitigation from uh, uh, the time that we are planning for a vaccination and immunization uh, because we still see uh, significant numbers um, uh, within the community who are hesitant or resistant to uh, uh, to vaccines uptake uh, because we think this is going to help uh, in the way that we design uh, emergency vaccination and in the way that we design routine immunization uh, and if you look at routine immunization we collect a lot of data but then the vaccine hesitancy part, the data is not as complete as we would like. So um, uh, these are two areas that we would like to go out um, in the coming months to uh, do some good um, uh, data collection uh, so that we can understand it uh, properly. And uh, in the next phase, whether it is routine or uh, emergency, um, uh, vaccines um, uptake should be improved from what uh, we have currently. Back to you, Monsa. Thanks very much, uh, Ahmed. Uh, really very important points again, as uh, as always. Um, the point again about sort of the age groups and and segmentation and understanding the um, the factors that influence people's decision and and and, uh, and the hesitation. Um, the point about health workers is really so important. We have seen this all over the world. Uh, surprisingly, uh, in, the, in the case of COVID the vaccines, of course, um, and uh, it just really speaks to the power of um, uh, sort of, un, how say, unscientific kind of communication, you know, from uh, and public health communication, sometimes uh, not very successful, and, and the factors that go into that. Um, and, and also the point about really, the, really having research that distinguishes between emergency versus routine uh, immunization and having that um, having that uh, studies that support the rollout of vaccines in both contexts or in the different contexts. I think that's really, uh, really important. Um, the team is still uh, trying to get uh, Charles' uh, uh, connection, uh, the connection with Charles going, uh, 
to, to connect, but uh, maybe for now I'm going to uh, go to Michelle with my next um, my next question. Um, and Michelle, um, you have spoken about a number of uh, already started in your first intervention about uh, some of the research gaps and and uh, and the important. Uh, uh, research questions that you have, but maybe if you could speak specifically to the knowledge gaps you see in terms of addressing vaccine hesitancy and misinformation. Um, uh, Ahmed just mentioned this, uh, and also Jacqueline. So if you could elaborate on that from a UNICEF perspective, that would be great. Thank you. I mean, from a UNICEF perspective, I mean, there's a lot of work that's been done on the hesitancy and so on. But what I really wanted to focus on was the product innovations that are required from a supply chain lens, um, uh, you know, because I think that is critical in order to, to get the vaccines to the population and expand their use as well. So um, while there's a lot of ongoing work on uh, vaccine hesitancy and addressing that, um, a, a, a lot of collaborations with social media and, and various outfits, um, it, you know, from a supply chain lens, we see product innovation as, as critical. So looking at vaccine formulations, um, like your microarray patches, uh, reducing the, uh, the temperature sensitivity so that a larger cater of staff can actually administer or health workers can administer the vaccine is, is critical. And reducing those the the the, uh, the dosing schedule in the formulations as well and those um, antigen combinations so that you don't you you um, the loss to follow up and those missed children can be reduced so 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 those we see as critical needs within uh, uh, research needs within um, within the immunization space technology innovations um, critical as well I mean uh, we we moved towards when we saw in our temperature monitoring studies that there were lots of vaccines freezing along the supply chain. I mean, so uh, doing all uh, the, the demand creation, etc. But when you're vaccinating a child um, with, with uh, a vaccine that's potentially not potent or could even cause cause damage or an adverse an adverse event, it really is critical that we also focus on the quality of, of, of the vaccines uh, moving through the supply chain as well. So uh, innovations like freeze-free vaccine carriers um, and active vaccine carriers to ensure that we can reach uh, those those communities um, uh, with with potent vaccines is is, is critical. Obviously, um, in in the last couple of years as well, when when we look at storage, um, there's been a whole evolution from in in solar technologies as well, particularly for refrigeration where we saw that batteries, for instance, were a weak link in, 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 in the storage capacity. So taking that out and the development of the solar direct drive refrigerators has been a, a big game changer in terms of in, ensuring that, so that, that we have gr um, good storage, um, that it's fit for purpose. I mean, I come from South Africa. There are a lot of um, electrics, um, um, electricity shortages, but, you know, but I've worked across the continent as well. Well, and uh, you know that is a critical challenge in uh, particularly at at your your service delivery point. So making sure that that is that that is available, and then of course uh, things like traceability. We saw with uh, there was a lot of distrust in 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 uh, during COVID with the COVID vaccine. So making sure that 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 there is that authentication from from the manufacturer to to um, throughout the supply chain to the point of use, which would increase the health worker confidence as well in terms of utilizing the the, the vaccine. And, and then of course, using AI machine learning uh, from the the huge amount of data that we um, that 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 the governments have to be able to optimize supply chain um, from them, then of course there's obviously the operational research as well, um, uh, because I think uh, you mentioned it early on about the fact that there are a lot of vertical there's a lot of verticalization and it doesn't serve. Um, we, we need to make sure that there there, there is an integrated um, delivery approach at at uh, country level that health systems we, we're speaking to the health needs of the community as well so you know that primary health care strengthening to improve coverage and equity in our programming but also that optimal system design as um, too and then finally and I think um, um, Dr. Ahmed um, touched on that as well is is that 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 
that people piece, the health worker piece, you know, using science, using research to improve um, motivators, understand those behaviors and and and, and improve performance of, of, um, of the health worker cater, your cold chain officers, supply chain officers within within the health system as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Michelle. Um, you talked about a number of really important things, and and kind of as, as you were speaking, I was kind of like imagining, you know, there is kind of like the the science and discovery and manufacturing, and then there is you know the populations, and there is kind of like the road in between, right? You know, the we need you know technology, cold chain, uh, messages, communication, uh, you know, systems in place to for the delivery. These are all, and they all need to be uh, kind of lined up, so to speak, to to really reach the um, uh, to reach the intended uh, targets. Uh, you also um, talked about, as you're speaking, also talking about kind of the routine immunization. It kind of reminds me, many of us know, um, or have seen, you know, of course, uh, you know, UNICEF's or government, national governments kind of campaigns. You know, like you have routine immunization, but then you have catch-up campaigns sometimes in, in certain situations, uh, and kind of you know what why do you know why certain people line up or populations line up for vaccines and so others are completely hesitant they don't want anything so it's really that kind of of knowledge then and that kind of knowledge gaps in terms of what ticks what works and and what doesn't i think it's really um you kind of alluded to to all of this and, and of course in terms of uh, technology and product innovations which are also of course uh, key for uh, um, um, can make a make or break kind of the acceptability of uh, vaccines for certain populations. So that these are really great uh, great points. Um, I think <clears throat> excuse me. I think Charles is still having. Uh, there are still some uh, challenges with the connectivity. Uh, we still have time to work on that. So what? But what I would like to do now, uh, Charles, can you hear us? Uh, is there one of the participants? Sorry, and I see his hand was up at some point. Yeah, I think the, there is something with the sound and connectivity. I think there's still some challenges. Charles, we're still here. We'll hopefully uh, we'll work, we'll uh, resolve the connectivity issue, um, whether it's from our side or your side. But what I would like to do now is I'm going to um, we now transition into the segment of the Q and A segment where uh, we are inviting our participants and audiences to uh, and uh, to ask uh, questions or make comments in the chat and the Q platform um, and maybe I'll ask uh, uh, Ahmed Michelle and Jacqueline to turn your cameras on um, for uh, you know for um, uh, in preparation for responding to some of the comments or questions you might receive from the uh, participants um, and I'm going to question from the panel so we have a question already <clears throat> Um, adverse events, although usually infrequent, to what extent were these appreciated and addressed? Um, so I think the question is sort of how do we address adverse uh, reactions, for example, to vaccines, uh, which of course uh, is some, you know sometimes happens and sometimes it contributes to the hesitancy or misinformation or, or, or uh, rejection of some of the vaccines. So. Um, Michelle, could I maybe start with you? I'm sure with UNICEF's uh, history, I've come across this uh, a few times. Sure, and I think um, it, 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 you know, collectively making sure that we are tracking adverse events, that um, where there are clusters, that that is addressed um, um, very, very quickly, so that there isn't any damage done to that. Because uh, to the program, I mean, we obviously we see that um, that that there are adverse events. Um, that that are minor and uh, part of the of of, of how the, te the 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 vaccine works. So you know that communication, making sure that health workers understand that can communicate that in terms of what to expect when when receiving a vaccination um, and 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 when it's normal and when it's not is going to be critical and key. And I think um, a, a tracking those, making sure that we understand with and addressing the uh, the adverse events very very quickly. 
um, um, and, and the concerns from the community would be a critical part of it. But, you know, I think um, before you even get that, I think reducing those by ensuring that there's, uh, that, that there, there's quality control throughout the supply chain, that there is that visibility, that um, that vaccines are being stored optimally, that they, they, they're not being frozen, causing um, uh, reactions uh, with, with, within uh, uh, within the patient as well is 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 very very important so uh, you know i think there's a lot of different pieces in order to to prevent but then also address monitor and track as well so you know these these these, these are different mechanisms and areas that 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 we look at to to support governments thanks thanks very much michelle very uh, very helpful um, ahmed jacqueline would you like to come into this question yeah, and really just agreeing with what Michelle has said, this is done at both the health facility level as well as the community level. Health facility, we already have dedicated forms for this. Healthcare workers are trained on this. Unfortunately, most of the community members will more often than not not go to the health facility uh, to report anytime they have negative outcomes following uh, the immunization, which is where now the community health workers come in because they are right there with the community members they're able to follow up once these members have received vaccination to see how you are progressing uh, from when you get the vaccination. We've had instances, for example, in Kenya where, uh, for example, an old man in one of the sub counties died immediately after vaccination, you know, and that sparked a whole set of rumors in the, at the community level. And if it was not uh, for the community where health workers who are there at that level, who are able to quickly capture that, report that using the digital tools and have that investigated to manage the, the rumors and really correct the information, then that would not have been uh, possible. So having that mechanism at the community level becomes very critical, even as we ensure that, you know, there's quality control at the supply of the supply chain, as well as having the necessary reporting mechanisms at the health facility strengthening that uh, component at the community level also uh, remains as a very critical pillar to ensure that we can manage uh, any negative effects and uh, be able to report uh, appropriately when they happen. Thanks very much, uh, Jacqueline. Yeah. Very important points about uh, surveillance and reporting uh, of adverse effects, of course. Uh, uh, Ahmed, please come in. Yes, yes. Let me, I think very well covered by my two colleagues there. Let me, let me take the, the reality approach. <laughs> this is one of those areas that we are very good at planning for, but very poorly implemented. Um, <clears throat> we don't actively, at the point of a vaccination, uh, communicate the possibilities of adverse effects. The follow-up is not as uh, efficient, and many, uh, especially when they are uh, moderate to mild, uh, will not be reported. While what we need is information about all adverse effects. That way we can be able to plan better um, and give feedback to um, the manufacturers in a way that will help um, uh, in improving uh, some of these formulations. So there is a gap there that needs to be filled by um, very important education to the communities, very important education and facilitation to the health workers, very um, effective uh, documentation and then follow up. Uh, we know all this chain, but then it's not done as efficiently as it should. And that's why you, in many countries, the database of adverse effects is so small when you compare to um, what is known to be the average uh, proportion of those who actually get um, uh, advanced effects. And um, looking at COVID season, uh, we, we are collecting data that is very difficult to uh, extrapolate. Um, uh, and we need to do a, a lot more work, particularly in providing the information and collecting the data in an active way uh, uh, so that we can action um, whatever results uh, that we are getting. A lot of work that needs to be done in this area. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Ahmed. Um, and as we're uh, also, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, as more questions are coming in, Ahmed, I want to uh, pick on um, a question or a point uh, you raised earlier um, about the the regulatory environment. You know, we keep talking about the regulatory environment for vaccine manufacturing, having appropriate or conducive or welcoming and, and appropriate uh, regulatory environment for vaccine manufacturing and production. 
but is there also a need for um, uh, what other policy and regulatory environment do we need for the uptake and rollout of vaccines as well? Is there a different regulatory framework that is needed? You know, for example, as we were just talking about sort of uh, reporting on, on adverse effects, for example, is that a regulatory, is that an operational issue? Is that a policy issue? So maybe just your reflections on the um, on the um, regulatory environment for in Africa for uh, rollout and, and uptake, if we uh, can look at it in that way. <coughs> oh, we can hear. Yeah, you'd think we know how to do these things. But <laughs> no, not yet. We need a few more years of this. I yeah. So three. <laughs> three uh, the first is the classical regulatory um, uh, framework, where you get um, uh, our national regulatory authorities doing their, their work, which then contributes to confidence by um, uh, the population that what is being manufactured is of good quality. So that is there. The second part is uh, what, what you're, you're asking around, um, and, and these will not be regulatory, but it will be uh, policy guidelines, capacity building frameworks, where um, th those things that need to be monitored by uh, authorities have a standard way of being monitored. When you're talking about adverse effects, for example, we know what we are looking for. The questions that are being asked, the data that is being collected is similar across the country, indeed for us across the continent. That way, it is easy to be able to interpret, compare, and then um, uh, moderate as, a, as, a, as appropriate. Now, that space, um, as, a, as I was saying, although there is a lot that is known that needs to be done, it is not being done. So how do we monitor it? This needs the Ministry of Health to establish a very strong pharmacovigilance um, a unit uh, that can be able to actively go out and uh, monitor the routine uh, vaccines and emergency vaccines whenever uh, that uh, is necessary. The third is um, more like a research question because um, um, uh, how accepting will the African public be of vaccines that are manufactured locally? We are very big on local manufacturing and we need to start very early to engage with uh, members of the public so that they know that um, as we talk about local manufacturing, we are talking about good quality products, not just because the regulator has said, but because we have also engaged with the, with the, with the public and they know that we are doing uh, gold standard work. That way, when the product comes, they can be able to, um, uh, to accept it easily. And this is important because when adverse effects are not being um, actively monitored today, and then you do local manufacturing, you strengthen your mechanisms of, uh, of surveillance, and then suddenly you're seeing this spike in, uh, in uh, adverse effects, then people may say, oh, it's because the products have been manufactured locally, which is not true. That is why that third aspect of uh, what space, what gaps are there um, in as far as uh, communicating with the public that whatever products have been manufactured locally is of good quality, that too needs to come uh, into play. These are the three big buckets that I would, I would say are very important as we go forward in, uh, um, uh, in this area. Thanks. You are on mute. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> it's my turn now. Uh, Ahmed, thanks very much. I was saying uh, that you don't know it, but you answered or you responded to one of the questions that came from one of the participants in the chat already about the um, the acceptance or the perceptions of local versus uh, imported vaccines and and how that affects uh, the uptake and acceptance among uh, pop populations. So thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, Jacqueline, please come in. Yes, mine is quick just to add on on what uh, Oguel has raised. I think one of the reasons why we had such low reporting of the adverse events after uh, following immunization was because of uh, the reporting mechanism that was there in place. I think for most of the countries, this was done separately from what was being able to capture the client details uh, before they received the vaccination. So considering that we had a very limited workforce that was dealing with the vaccination, and then of course, after vaccination, you have to go back and fill out a separate form if you have, if any of these uh, adverse events are um, 
are reported, that in itself uh, hampered the efforts. And perhaps what we should be focusing on now is really ensuring that that AFI, AEFI uh, system is integrated in the normal DHIS system. Now, especially that we're having a break from, uh, you know, the major emergencies that we have on the continent to, as part of preparedness so that anytime we need to report on that, then it's one seamless data management system as opposed to having separate systems where we capture the client information. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Jacqueline. Jacqueline, we have a question for you from our one of our participants. So please uh, stay, stay on the screen. Um, says, Dear Jacqueline, about a vaccination against COVID-19, considering that the African continent was somehow less impacted during the pandemic, what is your opinion regarding the establishment of routine immunization as in the case, uh, um, as is the case in the DRC, and thinking about the fact that the community does not trust in this vaccination? Good question, and I think this is something we are constantly uh, talking about. We say the African continent was spared, but when you look at the case fertility rate, the chances of dying once you got infected were higher on the African continent, which builds a case for why we need to stay protected all the time. Uh, and when we look at the people who are most affected are the people who are vulnerable, the people living with NCDs, our healthcare workers. And when we look at the trends, we are battling two different uh, uh, epidemics on the continent, we are still try, trying to deal with the infectious diseases as well as the non-communicable diseases. So as long as the threat of non-communicable diseases is there on the continent, it means we need to be better prepared, which means we need to adopt the routine uh, immunization of our adult population or people living with NCDs with the COVID-19 vaccination if we have to stay protected. So there's a case for it. And uh, our governments, our ministries of health should definitely be laying emphasis on why we need to integrate this and provide the adequate resources, resources to ensure that those who need to access it are able to access it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. Um, we have also, I'm not going to comment because I want to make room for the uh, questions that are coming from the participants. Uh, we have an, another question that uh, is coming in to say, uh, and the question is, uh, what need, and I think this is to all the our panelists. Um, the question is, what needs to be in place to get uh, to get adequate coverage required for herd immunity in children to prevent recurrent measles outbreaks experienced in many countries throughout Sub-Saharan Africa? Is there a guideline for catching up children up to 59 months old within the routine uh, EPI? Uh, and I think this is for um, for all our uh, panelists. Maybe I'll start, Ahmed, I'll start with you. Yeah, so <clears throat> the whole con the whole area, if you want, um, of um, routine immunization is very well established in most countries, except where the systems are really uh, being challenged by local uh, security issues. Um, conflict ETC, but those systems are in place. The gap there is are, um, uh, largely uh, the challenge is the zero dose children. How do we get to that very last mile? And um, those strategies need to be put in place to include um, very good registration of children. We know when they have, uh, where they have been born and the community health workers can do a good job of this uh, when the civil registration system is a bit slow. Um, um, are, how available are, um, are the routine um, uh, vaccines, whatever it is that they are needed, and how accessible is it to the population? So the usual health system issues are important. But in addition to that, we need um, governments to begin um, the education of how important vaccines are in reducing um, uh, morbidity and mortality um, to be a regular piece of information. It, sh it shouldn't be something that you learn in medical school. It shouldn't be something that you learn when you're unwell and you've gone to the health facility. It is the kind of information that can easily be able to be integrated into our health, into our education systems, so to we grow up knowing that uh, this has made a difference. And we have all the data that we can be able to show uh, for that. It makes a difference, it has made a difference. And so making sure that your child, your, uh, 
you know, your, your neighbor's child has actually gotten um, uh, uh, vaccinated, uh, immunized, is important. So uh, for me, uh, those two things, um, getting this as part of regular education, and then second, putting in place strategies to address zero-dose children will um, uh, reduce um, uh, the risk of um, uh, spread of, as, as uh, the, the, the question is, measles, ETC, it will reduce uh, that risk uh, quite significantly. Thanks. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, Michelle? So we saw with um, with uh, the pandemic that there was an uh, with the focus on um, on COVID vaccination on activities lockdowns um, and the, the um, border restrictions etc that they were there was a lot of backsliding of um, of uh, coverage in and um, and a big increase in zero dose children and with that um, uh, the the the, the immunization community um, decided to to support governments to drive the big uh, a big catch up and it was phrased the big catch up the collaboration WHO we have Gavi funding a lot of these vaccines to support this this um, outreach to make sure that 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 we are addressing some of the the backsliding and and strengthen the routine um, coverages with with within countries and I, I think the important thing here um, uh, in terms of sustaining those high coverages so that we don't get measles outbreaks etc is that we also need to have a look at the holistic needs of the community as well. Um, as, uh, you know, we saw in Nigeria, for instance, that um, populations were rejecting the polio vaccine um, simply because there were just campaigns and this was being forced on the communities all the time and it wasn't a priority for them. They, they felt their needs weren't being addressed either. So, uh, so making sure that we have a, an, an a supporting governments to have an integrated approach where the, the the entire health needs of the community are addressed the, that they have functional schools that they that that they the, and their nutritional needs are are addressed as well um is, is is critical in terms of the whole health system and and making sure that that piece in terms of immunization is also addressed thanks Thanks very much, uh, Michelle. Uh, going back to uh, you know some, something, Kat, uh, Jacqueline, you talked about before, kind of the community kind of aspect or community perspective, really important. Uh, Jacqueline, would you like to come into this point as well on this question? Yeah. In addition to what um, my the fellow panel, panelists have talked about, I think one of the things that we need to realize to appreciate is that missiles is one of the last childhood immunizations that is provided for most countries in, in the region. In Kenya, for example, you receive it at nine months. We have some countries that provide it at 12 to 15 months. And by that time, um, the mother has probably moved on to other things, which builds the case for why we need to look at the other social determinants of why we are receiving or not receiving our immunization. Sometimes the mother has already been trained uh, when they come for the first, the third, you know, the fourth month kind of immunizations for their children. They appreciate the need for immunization, but still by the ninth, ninth month, this is already out of the window and they're not bringing their children anymore to complete the immunization schedule. So looking at the social determinants of, of health becomes very critical um, as we move forward. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Jacqueline. Um, I have there are several questions from the uh, from the floor from the um, participants. So I'm going to ask two of them, and I'll ask you to uh, squeeze your answers very briefly uh, to be able to accommodate those two questions. We really uh, love having questions from our participants. Uh, one question is: uh, Do you perceive that uh, people's overall trust in government institutions impacts how they perceive vaccination initiatives? So that's one question. Um, and another question about uh, sort of funding um, uh, for vaccines, um, uh, kind of asking reflections from the panelists on the importance of uh, sort of African funding for African uh, vaccines. I'm paraphrasing the question because it's a long question, but I wanted to um, um, make sure we have time to address it. So the first question about does, you know, about the uh, institutions, government institutions and the impact of that or potential impact of that on acceptability of, uh, 
of um, uh, impact on how per perceived vaccination initiatives uh, by populations. So maybe um, anyone would like to come in onto that first one. Ahmed, please come in. You know, thanks. And, and, and so let me let me combine the two because they're very related um, from right. my perspective. Uh, trust in government institutions then translates or is the result of investment by that government in those institutions. If a government feels this institution is important, they'll invest in it. And um, if uh, the public sees that there is significant investment by the government in that institution, it's serving their needs, they'll have more trust on it. That's why, to, to start with your second question, I am a strong believer that um, the key areas, uh, the key social areas, uh, health, uh, education, security, these should be uh, the government's responsibilities. It should not be aid, it should not be grants, it should not be, uh, it can only be investment but it should not be someone else is paying for it. As soon as you um, hand over that, it means that it is not as important to you. Um, and uh, that is uh, pillar four of the Africa uh, uh, New Public Health Order talks about domestic um, uh, resourcing. And when you invest uh, locally, uh, loc uh, uh, local resources, um, then institutions should be guided to perform better. And yes, there is a relationship between the trust that the public will have in a particular institution with the uptake of the vaccine, if that institution has something to do with, uh, with vaccination. So those two questions are very related, and I'm a strong, strong supporter of domestic resources being the ones that are being used in the social sector, including health. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Ahmed. Uh, Michelle and Jacqueline, I'm going to invite you uh, to, to say your last words on this uh, panel or uh, maybe in response to those uh, two questions in particular. Um, Michelle, go ahead. Sure. Um, uh, you know, I think um, Dr. Ahmed has summed it up quite nicely. I th uh, domestic resourcing is is critical. And um, we've seen it in the implementation of a lot of our programs when government does not invest their own budget in it, they don't invest their own uh, funding in it, then it's a little project that runs in parallel and then and once that funding ceases and the project ceases it dies um, because the, the, there's been no investment in it there's no ownership of it it's not a uh, it's it's not something that government believes in and their plan that they want to drive forward um, you know I said this in a, a, a regional immunization um, EPI man EPI managers meeting that really what what should be happening is that you have a government plan um, and donors can help where 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 they are fund where where they are funding gaps but that it's by and large a government plan funded by government with their priorities and you know whatever vertical programs want to come and support they support but they support in line with the government plan as well i worked for government for many years so you know i understand how it works so you know i think it is 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 critical that that we have that and i think it does build trust and pride in 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 uh, the the local solutions and 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 local institutions as well so I mean, I, I think it was very well articulated. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Michelle. Jacqueline? Yeah, and I want to agree with them that domestic resourcing is the way to go. But we've also had statements that, because right now we talk about 15% allocation to health of the GDP to health. But we also agree that 15% of an elephant is not 15% of you know, an ant or something. So our economies are small. And sometimes even if governments wanted to dedicate to allocate money to health, we are seeing most of the uh, governments allocating five to 6% um, of the country's GDP to health, not because they do not want, but sometimes because the money is just not there. The fiscal space is very limited. And so I think moving forward, we also want to recommend that uh, we grow our economies. We can grow them by fair trade. We can grow them by restructuring the debt. We can grow them by canceling the debts, but until we actually grow 
uh, the economies until we grow the pie, then it becomes very difficult to even, you know, talk about allocating more to health, in which case we reduce our dependency on development aid. So yes, that next step is going to be allowed for us to really be um, a little less dependent on aid and really just have this through domestic financing. Thank you. Thanks very much. And again, to go back to the first uh, question, which is uh, or the comment on the first question, which is also that having that sort of government momentum and funding and uh, kind of is uh, hopefully will increase sort of the reassurance of the population that this is a national priority, that the government is standing behind it. It's not a, a foreign agenda or some other, you know, influencing factor that sometimes kind of uh, 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 how to say fuels rumors and and misinformation. Uh, so I think that uh, really uh, government planning and government funding is, is indeed key. Um, we could go on for several hours in this conversation, but I realize everyone has a uh, limited time and we need to really uh, wrap this up and and hopefully uh, come back to many of those uh, uh, points and including with Charles. Hopefully next time the connectivity will uh, will work much better. Um, I would like now to move on to uh, the final part of our uh, uh, webinar today, which is to invite uh, Melissa Hisko to provide the, her concluding remarks. Uh, Melissa, if you could come on the screen, that would be great. Uh, turn the screen on. Uh, Melissa uh, Hisko is the Director for Global Immunization and Nutrition at Global Affairs Canada. Um, she has previously served as Director of the COVID-19 Global Task Health Task Force, where she managed Canada's international aid commitments and investments to combat COVID-19 on a global scale. Uh, Melissa has held various management roles in, at Global Affairs Canada, including Deputy Director for Nutrition, Departmental Youth Focal Point, and Advisor to the Deputy Minister of International Development, where she led on multiple, uh, multilateral policy and programming uh, issues, as well as international aid partnerships with Canadians. Uh, uh, Melissa, it's a pleasure to have you ag again with us today in the second webinar as uh, our co-organizer for the webinar. So please, uh, uh, Melissa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me today and for the for the warm introduction. This has been an exciting discussion that builds on uh, the first webinar that, that I was a part of. So it's a, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today. Au nom d'Affaires mondiales Canada, j'aimerais remercier les collègues et les partenaires qui ont pris la parole. The name of uh, World Affairs Canada, it uh, is my pleasure to welcome you here today. Thank you for sharing your ideas on the distribution and usage of vaccines. Presented here today who have been working so diligently to ensure that everyone who wants a life-saving vaccination can actually access one. And it's been a real pleasure to hear um, the different perspectives of the panelists today. So many of you spoke about the importance of strong and resilient health systems for effective vaccine distribution and sustained vaccine confidence. Um, this was certainly true in the context of the pandemic, but it's also true for ongoing routine vaccine immunization and protecting against future crises. So I think we learned the hard way in the pandemic that health systems resilience can't be addressed in times of panic or in times of crisis, but that the foundation needs to be, uh, it needs to be nurtured and it needs to be enhanced between those crises to actually deliver um, effectively when when one occurs. So for our part, Canada has prioritized support for vaccine delivery in our routine immunization efforts and our COVID-19 response and recovery efforts internationally. So this has included some dedicated support through CanGive, the Global Initiative for Vaccine Equity, where we have prioritized strengthening immunization systems, training healthcare workers, and bolstering community engagement to address the gendered barriers um, to vaccination in particular. So throughout this pandemic, we also supported countries by providing ancillaries like syringes and cold chain support to facilitate successful in-country distribution. And this was actually an important learning from the pandemic, um, understanding that, you know, from the outset, a vaccination is going to require more than simply a vaccine and to plan for both that upstream and those downstream efforts to be addressed um, simultaneously and not uh, sequentially in the way that they were for, for the pandemic. So moving forward, um, I think you can expect Canada to continue our work with our partners like UNICEF, WHO and MREF, others who are on the call, um, including Gavi and the recently approved um, Manufacturing Accelerator to bolster sustainable manufacturing and to enhance immunization systems and catch up campaigns, uh, especially for the marginalized and the difficult to reach communities. 
including in humanitarian context, as you know, unfortunately, we know that more and more people are going to find themselves living in those situations. So today we've heard some important insights from all of our panelists, and if you'll permit me, um, I would love to share a few uh, that struck me and also share some ideas where Canada thinks we can um, continue to, uh, to prioritize some efforts. So firstly, uh, on gender, I think there is an abundance of research that's been undertaken um, on the gender barriers to vaccination, but there is considerably less research that has been done on how you can actually transition that into successful vaccination strategies. And so um, from our perspective, we see this as a real opportunity to learn from um, and to engage with communities to help to design more effective immunization programs. This is an area, for example, where um, IDRC's Equivalent research could play an important role, for example, with its focus on, um, on tools and mitigation of different access barriers, including those that are facing gender inequalities. The second is on the importance of integration, and this came out you know, multiple times throughout the webinar today. Efforts to bring health services and immunization services together where the people need them most, I think it's fair to say, still continue to be really siloed. And so there is an opportunity to, to, to limit some of this verticalization, to improve our, our PHC and our systems of design across the different sectors, and to better understand how um, we can take an integrated approach to increase uptake. So for example, um, through the, the CanGive program, UNICEF has actually rolled out joint uh, measles, rubella, and VAS um, vitamin A supplementation programming campaign in Mozambique, and we're clearly starting to see some great impacts through the bundling of these services. And so breaking down of those silos, you know, where, it, where it's feasible, where it makes sense in the right context, I think continues to hold um, considerable promise. Um, the third thing is really the importance of innovation. And I think Mrs. Uh, Seidel captured this well from from both a product development perspective, but also from a um, from a delivery systems perspective, that these are really critical areas for 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 countries, for multilateral organizations, for companies, for for donors like Canada, to invest in because we know that the payoffs can continue to be dramatic. Um, as an anecdote, I was I was recently in Ghana for uh, Gavi's board meeting. Um, I represent Canada on the Gavi board, and we were actually taken on a site visit um, where the Minister of Health um, and Gavi are working with a private company to actually deliver vaccines to to remote health facilities through um, through drone transportation. And this has had all kinds of positive impacts, um, including reducing cold chain infrastructure and cutting down the the, the delivery time from six hours plus down to, to, to 45 minutes. And so this is just one example of an innovation, but it's been nothing less than, than, than game changing in terms of access. And I think there is, you know, there's room to see much more of these innovations. And then lastly, um, a big topic today on the panel was really addressing mis and disinformation. I think it is critical to learn about the community led solutions uh, for addressing hesitancy and, and misinformation. And I particularly take the point um, of needing to leverage those existing uh, trust leaders within the community or I think knowledge gatekeepers were, were what Jacqueline called them to address the spread of, of false information. And I think it's also clear um, that we need to diversify our approaches to combating misinformation to reach all the different segments of the population. And so I appreciated the comment that in order to really achieve equity, we have to be very targeted in our approaches, including um, including healthcare workers. And we don't yet know all of the impacts that C19 has had on as a hesitancy. So really understanding um, you know, the impacts and the lessons learned there, I think will be will be critically important for uh, for the next crisis. So I'll stop there. Um, I really want to thank our panelists for the interventions and for the great questions that we've had today. Le Canada demeure déterminé à soutenir les efforts de l'Afrique pour protéger sa population. Remains determined to support African efforts uh, in uh, terms of vaccines. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Melissa, for your uh, inspiring remarks and, and uh, summarizing kind of Canada's commitment uh, uh, to global vaccine uh, security and, and supply. So thanks very much. Um, Charles, uh, can you hear us? Uh, and can you speak if you want to give, have the final word? We're a little bit over, we're a bit over time, but if you, finally we have you connected, so we don't want to lose that opportunity to give maybe a few remarks from uh, WHO Afro on the importance of the vaccine rollout uh, and gaps and opportunities for vaccine rollout and, uh, and uptake in Africa. If you could be very succinct, because we're a little bit over time, but we're delighted that you're able to join us finally. Yeah, thank you so much. I think 
one of the research topics that we need to have for this meeting is what happens. <laughs> there might be some uh, incompatibility between our networks, but I'm sure next time I hope you will invite me again to come. And I appreciate uh, this initiative. As uh, you, you, you would know, and with us at uh, the, the WHO, we are dedicated to the well being of all people, and we are guided by science. And that is why we lead and champion global uh, efforts to give everyone everywhere an equal chance to, li uh, to a healthy life. And vaccination being one of the greatest achievements of humankind is really one of the areas where we join with our partners, like most of whom are on this uh, uh, panel to ensure that um, as part of our immunization agenda 2030, we ensure everybody, everywhere, irrespective of who they are, irrespective of where they live, have access to the vaccines uh, that they need. And this year, it marks 50 years since the World Health, World Health Assembly launched the expanded program on immunization on the 23rd of May, 1974. And I call on you everywhere where you are to do it in your own way. Your organization, you as an individual to celebrate this achievement. 50 years of the global effort to give vaccines to everybody everywhere. So thank you all so much. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Charles. Um, I know we're all eager to hear more from you, but we'll save that for hopefully a, a next webinar. And here's my plug-in. We, we will be planning um, a third uh, in this series. Um, so we'll please uh, tune in to further information and we'll send you further information when that is uh, planned um, uh, a little bit in a few months. So um, I just end with thanking tremendous, with tremendous thanks to Ahmed, Michelle, Jacqueline and Melissa and, and you, Charles, for uh, joining us uh, today. Um, uh, we have uh, learned a great deal uh, and we will uh, continue this conversation. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, part of a chain of several conversations that are really important for advancing the, um, the uh, very important goal of the uh, African Union and African CDC of vaccine uh, sufficiency in Africa and, and up, uh, ramping up production and acceptance and the uptake of, of, of vaccines. Thank you very much also to our participants, our interpreters, our, you know, and all the teams in the background that have worked to bring this uh, webinar to become um, a reality today. Um, we look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Um, this webinar will be available shortly on um, the link or so the recording of the webinar will be available shortly as soon as uh, some of the technology background is, is kind of completed. So please uh, tune in to, to have access to this webinar and also the, the recording of the previous uh, webinar. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day and we'll uh, hope to see you very soon again. Take care. Goodbye. Okay.